I'm Jesse. Thanks for coming. Well, lots of people this morning. So it's, um, it's good to see everybody um, in church or online. We appreciate you plugging in. Um, I do have a handful of announcements today. Uh, the first one is tonight at 6.30, the post high school 20-something are meeting at Pastor Phil's house at 6.30. Um, if you need directions, they are um, at, or you can email info at um, eCrossroads. It says tonight. Oh, no, it doesn't. I read it wrong. It's tomorrow night. Don't come tonight. Sorry. Or you can come say hi, but it's tomorrow night at 6.30. Sorry. Sorry. I read it wrong. Tomorrow night at 6.30. No, you read it right. Just keep going. We so, got it. Oh, I'm so confused. Okay. All right. It's tomorrow night. All right. Moving on. So um, we have our children's ministry are taking a break for the summer, um, a well-deserved one. So we still need some, our regular workers. So we need um, some volunteers in the back to come hang out with these awesome kiddos that you are about to see. Um, so if you would like to do that, we need you to fill out a background check and you can leave it at the ministry table, um, the children's ministry table in the back. Um, we have a summer evening service this Wednesday at 6.30. Um, it's starting with an ice cream social and then there's gonna be some worship um, in the garden with Jen and Matt um, and our rest of our music team and our um, children's pastor, We'll be doing some games with the kids. So kids can come, neighbors can come, all kinds of um, people can come and do that. That is this Wednesday at 6.30. We have our um, VBS is August 1st through the 5th. It's from 9 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. This is for kids entering first grade and um, through sixth grade in the fall. The sign up is at the children's desk in the hallway. And we also are, are in need of adult volunteers. And so if you're able to do that, um, you can look for either more information or help sign up through that with info at ecrossroads.net. And that's also the registration form for the kids. Um, it's a great time. I'm really bummed that I have to work this summer and cannot come. So, um, but it's a fabulous week to watch those elementary school kids just thrive and enjoy each other and learning about um, about their their Lord. So if you can volunteer, that would be fabulous. Um, I think that is all I have. So if you have any more um, questions or need to find other events, you, there's a website, the weekly, weekly email, our welcome table, which is through the double doors. Um, there's information out there. You can also fill out our in touch form, which is in your bulletin. Um, and if you have any questions, again, it's the info at ecrossroads.net. And that's all I got. Thanks. All right. I'm going to ask you guys to rise. All right. And what I want you to do right now as we do this today, it's time. Some of us are having difficulty rising. Um, we're all getting older. So one of the things... I want you, Lydia, give me, a, give me a little room in the back row. One of the things I want you to get this morning is a vision. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, we got a new baby in the room, you know, ADD boy, new baby walks in the room for the first time, and I got to like, Doug and Christy, congrats, we're glad you guys are here. Um, and we won't, uh, Yeah, so we just woke up the baby. Nice job, you guys. All right. <laughs> but um, so here's what I want you to get a vision of this morning. And not that it'll be this elaborate every week, but it is time to upgrade Family Communion Sunday. And, we, you know, Family Communion Sunday went away during the pandemic. So in the fall, we want to bring it back. But we want it to be more incorporated with the kids doing more, doing some readings, doing, you know, doing some of the leading and that type of thing. So they're giving us a little taste of what that could look like today. So let's, let's do the call to worship together and let's show the kids, well, they know because they're in here every week, how we do the call to worship. So I've, you've got the bold words and don't let me be louder than you. We 
Thank God for joy, for laughter, for abundant blessings of every kind. We thank God when we can and as we can for struggles, for solitude, for fears. Give thanks to God at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank God that in Christ our joys as well as our pain, our losses as well as our laughter are in God's heart and hands. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay, you ready? For Eli to take away? Eli, Eli, Eli take it away! away. Here come the kids. Yeah! I wish I was cool enough to pull off a rainbow unicorn. Uh, man, that was cool. All right. So. 
Give it one second for, uh, yeah. <laughs> help these guys transition. All right, you're gonna want them to stand now, right? Yeah, all right. So um, as we take our offering, we reflect on the words of scripture and uh, today it's just about being thankful. So we are thankful, uh, if I can get the next one please. Right. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, when we talk about how we give, right? Talk about giving cheerfully, regularly, proportionally, sacrificially. And this idea of in everything we, we give thanks to God for God's love and for God's grace and for God's and for new life. You know, uh, that was fun to see the kids up here and to see the kids singing and to see the smiles on the faces. And yes, to see the unicorn <laughs> uh, top, man. It's just a reminder of God's love. And you know, as we thank God for everything, you know, this morning we're thanking God uh, for Don Furman and Don Furman's life. And then, you know, one of the crazy things about being a pastor around here is we went from Don, you know, celebrating Don's life and thanking God, um, you know, for who he has been in our midst and thanking God that, you know, Don has made that transition to heaven. And then Joanne and I scooted off to a baby shower uh, for Mitchell who just, and his wife, Abby, who just took the kids away. And then later on, we headed over to a grad party for a couple, for, you know, for Eli, who was back there, you know, just there singing, right? And so we just thank God for life and how it goes on and on and on. And as we do take our offering, we do want you to be able to give cheerfully, regularly, right? So this is a place of freedom. I feel no obligation to participate in the, in the offering here. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free, and we don't want to put that on people, especially we know that the offering can be a place where um, people do have some bondage. So feel no obligation. I know some of you do like to participate. So if you want to participate right in, in the room, there's a box in the back. If you're online, there are uh, many of you have been giving through the app or the website through the giving options there. You just click on the buttons there and it'll take you to that. Or I've been uh, mailing in your offerings, uh, which we appreciate. So let's say a word of prayer and then continue our time of worship. Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for the gift of your love, and we thank you for the gift of new life. Um, we're just grateful that Doug and Christy are here, um, the beauty of, of their new child, and just surround them in your love. Let them feel your peace that surpasses all understanding. And for Dom, we thank you. He, he has been a gift in our lives, and he continues to be a gift, a gift in our lives. So be with all who are, you know, who are missing him right now and all who are, uh, you know, grieving, help them to grieve as those who have great hope in you. We ask you to be uh, specifically with Andrea as she goes through a difficult time, so continue to guide her and, and be with her and lead her. And now I'd invite you in the silence of your hearts to lift up any other intentions that you have. And come, Lord Jesus, come and come and guide us, come and lead us as we lift our voices to honor you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's rise and lift our voices. Time is in his hand. 
So this is the time in our service. We're just going to pause it all, take a nice deep breath, and just be with God in our prayer. Um, before we do, though, I was thinking, you know, yesterday my husband and I were walking in the church, and we saw we have our He is Risen sign out there, and I was like, I know we really probably should be taking that down because Easter's gone, but this is a great reminder to walk in the door, just be reminded all the time that He is risen. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, just like we sang about. He is our King. And so I love that reminder. So you're just going to see that all year round until Easter comes again. <laughs> and thanks to the fourth size for the beautiful sign, too. Um, so let's take some time and pray right now. You know, in the song we just sang, we said, Lord, that you were risen in power and that you were alive. And the stone is rolled away. Death is conquered, and our Savior holds those keys. And that is just a big, big concept, God, that you and I 
and all of us in here, we get to meet you face to face someday. And I know that is so big to imagine, and I just want us to just take a moment and imagine that. That the king of this universe, the God who made this world, the God who rules this world, the God who cares about this world, that we get to meet you someday. So Father, I just, I want to thank you for sending your son into this world. That Jesus, you walk to this earth and you feel the joys that we experience, you feel the pain that we've experienced, you feel the hurt, the grief, the anger. You have felt all the emotions that we feel. You walk to this earth, you walk with us every single day. Forgive us when we forget that. Forgive us when we try to do life on our own. Just thank you for being the savior of our life. Amen. So let's read together um, from 1 Timothy 6. You guys will follow our leaders. In his perfect time, he will come. Blessed is the only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He alone possesses immortality. He makes his home in matchless, blinding, brilliant light that no one can approach. No mortal has ever seen him and no human can. So let it be that all honor and eternal power are his. Amen. As we come to the table, we remember the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If you haven't gotten a, a communion cup yet, uh, Jesse is heading around and she will um, get them for you. So just raise your hand and she'll go to the different uh, sections and, and make sure you have one. So what, is it, what does Paul mean when he says... We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, first of all, we proclaim that Jesus is Lord. He's God. He's the one that we follow. He's the one that we put our hope and our trust in. And then when we proclaim his death until he comes, we're proclaiming that that death is a freeing death, that it saves us from our sins. It saves the world from its entrapment to sin. And it truly frees us for someday, yes, but also for today that day by day we live more and more into the beauty of, of what God has for us, into the beauty of God's salvation. So it, we rightfully say that Jesus is, is our Savior. To proclaim, Je to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes is to proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. And if you come this morning in the room or online and you don't proclaim that, well, I'm just really glad you're here. 
And I'd invite you to keep coming as we talk about what it means to follow Jesus Christ and what it looks like to, to follow Jesus Christ. And if today you want to make that commitment for the first time, well, then praise God and feel free to join us in the simple act of taking communion. And then see one of us pastors afterwards, myself, Jen, Dave, Phil, uh, and we can talk to you about what a life of following Jesus looks like. But we do this because our Lord and Savior himself told us to do this. But on the night before he died, he took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his loved ones. He gave it to his friends. He said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This, this is my body given for you. Do this in memory of me. Then he took a cup. He said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This cup is my blood shed for you, shed for many, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. We're going to pray right now, and I'm going to leave a pause in this prayer for a time of confession. And the scriptures say, you know, prepare yourself before taking the cup. But there's something really important, right? Which is that when we, when we confess, right, John tells us in one of his letters, his first letter, perfect love drives out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. I don't want to confess out of a place of fear because I trust that my faith is in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. But I confess out of longing. I long to be more and more the person that God created me to be day by day as Jesus walks in my life. And that's how I would encourage you to confess this morning. I have a longing to be who God has called us to be. So would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we love you and we praise you. And as we come to share in this simple act, we, we pause. We pause. I pause to confess those places where I don't love you the way you call me to, and I don't love my neighbor the way you call me to. And so I, I just want to do that now, and mostly because I want to be more and more like you by the power of your Holy Spirit working in my life. So I invite you in the silence of your hearts to confess those places where you're like me and you don't love your neighbor the way you're called to and you don't love the Lord your God the way you're called to. I invite you to do that now. Father, we humbly ask you to bless this bread and to bless the cup. May it remind us of your love, but so much more than that. May it fill us with your love and connect us with your love. May it make your love real and alive and present in our lives so that we can shine your light in all the places you would take us. In Jesus' holy name we pray and all God's people said, amen. So if you've never used these before, the top just kind of peels back. Um, my brothers and sisters, take and eat the body of Christ broken for you. take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. And if you join me once more in prayer. Heavenly Father, as you have been with us as we watch beautiful children and teens lead us in worship, as you've met us in this time of song and prayer, continue to guide us and lead us as we turn our attention to your wisdom and your way, to your holy words. And that's all I want us to hear this morning, your wisdom and your way. So if my words get in the way, just let them go away. So only your light would shine in this time and place. In Jesus' holy name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Well, as you come today, we are continue on in our summer series. In the summer, we are in the book of Ephesians, but I want to pause uh, for uh, today. I mean, we are going to be in the book of Ephesians, but I want to talk about ordination. Because we've been talking a lot about ordination lately because our buddy Dave recently got ordained. And you see, there's now two ordination stoles on the cross we established last week. His is definitely nicer than mine. <laughs> I'm going for the upgrade, okay? Um, but, but the ordination leads to some questions because, you know, one of the, the characteristics of our church is people come from all different types of churches. 
some churches that did ordination for pastors, some that didn't. Some people know what that is. People don't know what that is. So here's, I want to ask, answer some things today, right? So what is it? What's ordination? Why now? I, I, I'm not saying he's old, but he's been a pastor for a long time. Like, why, why is he getting ordained now, right? And then, most importantly, when's the party? Okay, because, you know, we all like a good party around here. You can wear your T-shirts to your party. You're like, really, are you going to preach today in your T-shirt? Yes, because you can, this, the sale of the T-shirts is going on, right, for two more weeks, right? So um, if you want to get some or you want to get one of the other shirts, now's the time uh, that you can do that. All right, so let's start with, with what is it, okay? This comes to us from uh, what we call the covenant book of worship. So if you ever, you know, at a, a wedding or a funeral or we do baptism, like all those baptismal vows, the ordination vows, all this stuff we do at weddings and funerals, those prayers are in here. And in here, in the ordination section, before the ordination vows, it would say this, why we have ordination? Why ordination? What's that about? At the end of the first century, the early church was facing two stark realities. The apostles... The eyewitnesses to the resurrection and the great teachers of the faith were dying and Jesus had not yet returned. It was in response to this looming deficit that the early church began to shape the forms of the ordered ministry. A few from among the body would be set apart for ministry within the body, thus holding the church true to its beginnings in the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ born, Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming in glory. So there's Dave. He's just been ordained, and he has his stole on. I told you last week that the stole represents, right, that we are under the authority of Christ, and that it's a reminder to us, right, that we are servants, that we serve under Jesus, right, and we serve under the church, and ultimately, our job is to serve, is to serve you. What's that? He, it is glowing. He was really glowing that night, you know? He just, and he's glowing in part because the woman behind him has on, notice what she doesn't have on. She doesn't have on a robe and she doesn't have on a stole. She has on a really cool gold dress, which kind of helped the effect for Dave, okay? <laughs> like, he looks so angelic, okay? <laughs> But here's the reason why I give you this picture, okay, is because the woman behind him, there's only two people on the, on the platform that night that don't have a robe on and don't have a stole on. So the ordained people are laying hands on the new people coming in, right? So the laying of the hands, and that's been going on for generation after generation, at thousands of years, right? But... The two people uh, up front who, don't, who aren't pastors are there to remind the pastors that the stole is placed around on your shoulders by the church, by the people of the church. Your, your job is you, lay, you serve them. You lay down your life for them. So it's not one pastor putting a stole on another pastor. That woman's name is Rebecca Gonzalez, and her job was to represent all of you in putting that stole around on Dave's shoulders to remind Dave, and when, when I was there, to remind me that I serve you, right? That's my job. I serve you. So... Okay, that's what ordination is. Some people are set aside, but they are set aside to serve you. And it doesn't mean that those are the important people in the congregation and those are the people who do it all in the congregation, right? It means it's, it's all of us have a job. All of us work together, right? So that's Rebecca, right? So the covenant church, so this is now where you come in, right? 
The covenant church believes that there is only one mission of the church. So it's not like Dave and I have a different mission than all of you. We got the same mission that you have, but we just, it's our, our, the role that we play is a little different. Doesn't mean it's more important, right? The mission, so the only mission is the mission of God made known in Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. The mission of the triune God comes to expression through the ministries of the church, including worship, preaching, teaching, rites, sacraments, witness, and service as attested in the Holy Scripture. The mission belongs not just to the ordained, but to the whole church, all of us, all of you. Your commit, right? Your commission, your sent. You are, as we read in First Peter, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. When believers, corporately or individually, are called in the service of the Triune God, letting their words and please notice and actions. Bear witness to God's redemptive act. The essential ministry is being performed. All of us are called on mission. Some of us are set apart to preach and teach and to shepherd and to lead. It doesn't make us more important. In some ways, we're the least important. And we're the least important from the standpoint of, you know, it's not that we don't go out into the community, but... Our focus is primarily church. You all are in school and at jobs, and right? Like you're bringing, when, when you, you're going to let your light shine before men, you, you got to be where the people are, and you're where the people are. So in that sense, right, you really are more important than we are. Okay, so why now? <laughs> okay. There's an interesting thing in the bigger picture of the church. Uh, that will continue, okay? And so for years, like when Dave started 17 years ago, it, there was not a path for Dave to be ordained in the Covenant Church, which is the church that we serve. There wasn't a path for Dave to be ordained because he was bivocational, which means he had, he, as you know, he runs Renewed Hope Counseling Center. If, you, if you're newer and you don't know that, Dave is a pastor and a psychologist, and he runs our Christian Counseling Center, and he does a great job, and it's doing amazing things in this community. But in order to be ordained, you had to be in full-time ministry. And, and the Covenant Church recognized, uh, it's, it's about, I think the change was made about five years ago, that, wait a minute, the way the church is continuing to change in, in our culture. There's bivocational ministry is not just going to be like a few people. Bivocational ministry is going to be most pastors. Like we're heading to the point where it's going to be normal that pastors have outside jobs. It's going to be normal that a church says, hey, you know, we got this youth pastor. We can give him a house to live in, but we can't pay him full time. Can, can, can we get him started in a lawn business? <laughs> right? Seriously, other churches looked at us like, hey, man, that was, how'd you pull that off? That was a really good idea, right? Because that's the nature of things. So these bivocational people, the bivocational people in this church, Dave, Phil, Ben, Jen, Shannon, you lose all those people, right? Like, okay, I can't pull all that off, right? Like, think about how important they are. So the Covenant Church said, we have to, we have to recognize the importance of those ministries, and we have to honor those ministries. And we have to, we have to give them, because it is an honor to be called pastor, and it is an honor to be ordained. It's a very long process. It takes years, but, but it's, a very, it's an honor, and it's a humbling honor. So they made that path. So now Dave had that opportunity that he didn't have before because we made the uh, bivocational path, and, and he, he was allowed to be ordained. Uh, and 
I have a phone call with someone from denominational offices tomorrow. You guys did a nice job when I asked you to raz Phil, because he did say he did say he would he would go through the process here, and uh, they're going to call me tomorrow, and we'll we'll see when that's gonna when that's gonna play out. All right. <laughs> Speaking of Phil, he did mention that I left off um, in our prayer time the uh, the twenty something softball team. Apparently, they need some prayer, so, uh, <laughs> so if you could keep the softball team in your prayers, uh, uh, they would appreciate it. Amen. All right. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> All right. Now, the really important question, when's the party, right? August 14th, barbecue after the worship service, we'll do our normal thing. Uh, we'll be celebrating Dave, and we'll also be celebrating his wife, Linda, who has been, who has worked um, as our church administrator, you know, doing the business side of things for years. Uh, and so she is stepping back into like a, a semi-retirement. So, I mean, she'll still be here and all that, but, um, but she is stepping down uh, from that role. So we're going to want to celebrate her on that day as well. All right. So, wait, I just gave you all these fancy words. And do you notice... When the words come out of this book, they're fancy, and the sentences are long, right? Those of us, you know, who are the leaders sometimes forget that you can say things with simple words. You don't have to use all the big words, and, but we put all the big words into the book, right? But where, where are, are we, what book are we supposed to be following? This one or the other one, right? So, so what's the question that we always ask, Right? Like, okay, so you talk to us about or being ordained. Okay, Joe, what's the question? Where is it written? Where is that in the Bible? You can show me where that's in this book, right? But where is that in the Bible? Would it shock if I said it's in the book of Ephesians, right? <laughs> Since we're going through the book of Ephesians, all right? So where is it written? And then the next question how do we understand it? How do we understand it? So let me show you what's written. Let me show you how we understand it, okay? Ephesians 4 now is where we're at. We're in verses 7 through 16. And the theme is no longer being infants. And this first part is very poetic and beautiful. Basically, what you'll see is that what it says is that as Jesus comes down to earth, he puts some people in place, right? Right? And what I want you to listen for is who are the people who are put in place and what is their job? So it goes like this. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it said, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelism, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now, this, this section talks about the leadership positions and the work that they do. But, but notice, as each part does its work, that doesn't mean the other parts don't have a lot of work to do. They do. They, and the other parts are all of you, right? And all of us. So, so the key to understanding this is, this is how we grow up as a church community how we grow up as individuals, and how we also grow up and mature as a church 
as a, as, as a body of believers, you know, working together to bring God's love. So what does he say? Then we will no longer be infants. And, right, think, think about, I mean, we've seen some beautiful examples, right? Uh, it, she, Isabella Rose just left the room as I needed to make the uh, user as an example, but that's okay. <laughs> um, right? But just think of that beautiful, you know, Doug and Christie's beautiful little girl, right? Like how much she's de just completely 100% dependent on them right now. And it's beautiful and it's right. But what they want, what we all want, right, is for her to grow up and to be her own, to be who God created her to be. And she's on that journey. And in Christ, we're all on that journey in Christ, right? That's, that's how we all grow. So when we're infants, we can be tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. So the key idea here of, of the job is to grow and mature the body. Now here's the caution. All right, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go to a Jewish rabbi. Of course, the Jewish, you know, the Jewish people are studying what we call the Old Testament, so a lot of their ideas are our idea, are, 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 are ideas too, right? And I love the way this one rabbi, the guy's name is uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, says it. The great commandment is not thou shall be right. The great commandment is... To be in love. We so often think that like the teacher's job, you know, that Dave and I, our job is really, you know, to always be right and to teach you what is right and make sure you can check off the, you have this complete, perfect doctrine. You want to have complete, perfect doctrine? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Like that's, the commandment is to love. And of course, Jesus said it, right? And I just, just did it for you, right? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor. So the caution is, as we talk about growing up and we talk about maturing, the point of growing up and maturing is that we can love better and that we can be in love more with God and we can, we can love our neighbor and care for our neighbors in ways that are right and good and bring right love into this world. So, so here's, here's the call now for those people right on that list. The call is to equip all of you to serve. So, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, the pastors to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Our job as we serve you is to teach you how to serve and how to love and, and how to care in this world why, again, we're being built up into maturity so that we're not going to be pushed back and forth. So let's take a look at what we got. We got the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And what I got to, what I got to start with is this, is this. As in many ancient lists, as we go through the scripture, we've got all these lists. There's always a lot of overlap, okay? Some of these terms may overlap considerably Especially like in this list, the Greek indicates an especially strong overlap between pastors and teachers. They share a common focus and basis of authority as bearers of Christ's message. So let's start with the apostles. So what's an apostle and what does that look like? Well, one thing we got to say is there's some people who say like, you really shouldn't talk about the apostles. You should let the original apostles who were appointed by Jesus like, they're the only apostles, right? And then don't, you know, don't, don't talk about the apostles going forward from that. And, and the, the people who write books like this debate amongst themselves about those things. It's the, the debate's not really important for our purposes, okay? But here's what an apostle is. I'm going to give you an example of a person that some of you in the room remember. He's gone on to be with the Lord, but his name was Larry Sherman. 
And I was so, I, I can't tell you how blessed I was to have Larry Sherman in my life uh, early in my pastoral career. Because Larry was an apostle. Larry literally flew all over the country. Uh, Larry's been gone like eight years now. And I was just on the Covenant Pastors page on Facebook, right? Everybody's got to have their page. So, and somebody from Georgia was talking about, I came into the Covenant by Reverend Dr. Larry Sherman. And he lived right in South Lyon. And so he'd be flying all over the country, right? He was a member of our church. His wife, Deb, was a member of our church. So he'd be flying all over the country, helping all these churches get set up. And his advice was always like spot on. And I could just call him up and say, hey, can we get a breakfast? And it was always like, yeah, I'm heading out to the airport. Um, meet me for breakfast before my flight. And just to show you how long ago this was, big boy. Remember, it was, it was big boy. Remember, now it's Aubrey's. But remember when it was big boy? We would meet at big boy. And then he would head off, to the, head off to the airport, but I could get an hour or more of his time and just hear what it means to run a church. He did that for me. And to say he did it for 100 people is an understatement. Like, he, that's the job of the apostle. You come and you help. You meet with the, the local leaders. And you go from place to place to place to place. And you meet with the local leaders and you help them get, keep the church going. And you help them with mistakes. And, and the other thing that was beautiful about Larry is like he knew what I needed before I knew what I needed, you know. So I'd be, I, I, you know, like I'd just be getting high, you know, just like, oh my gosh, we got, I got to do this, 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 this. And I got to tell have the church to do this, this. And he'd just calmly say, Joe, do this. Read this book, okay. And when you're done reading, let's have lunch again, you know? So then I'd read the book and it'd just be like hitting me. Right? Oh my gosh, all those things I want to do. Like, wait, no. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm not going in the proper order, right? Like that's an apostle. We need apostles. We need the Larry Shermans of the world who go and help the local church. Now, the prophets and the evangelists in today's world, those are people who write, I mean, they maybe have blogs, or they have a podcast, or they write books. A lot of times, these are the people that we read, right, or we listen to. And, I mean, obviously, when you think of evangelists, you know, if you're older, right, you think of Billy Graham and his big crusades where he's filling up, you know, stadiums full of people. But again, if you try to put it into 2022, those people are getting those types of followings through the media, you know, through social media and, and their podcasts and that type of thing. And the thing about, I, I, the caution I want to give us on this, right, is that we, we give a lot of power to people who write books and who have podcasts and, or, or on TV, and we got to be careful, right? Because not all their ideas are right, and sometimes they can lead us in the, in the wrong direction. So part of the job of the pastors and the teachers is to say, right, like what you did in a few minutes ago when I said, what's the important question? And you all, you know, many of you said, where is it written? is to help us understand how to use those things in our lives. Look, man, most of these people, they're putting out great stuff that's helpful. It'll be helpful with your walk and it'll be helpful with your journey, right? It's not bad stuff, but we have to, we have to be wise, right? So in scripture, what do we read in 1 John, right? Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Jesus says it like this in, John, in Matthew 7, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. 
By their fruit, you will recognize them. Now that's the key right there. I'm going to give you a list from uh, the book of Galatians that talks about what the fruit of the Spirit looks like. But, what, but before Paul gives us this list of what the fruit of the Spirit looks like, he gives us another list. He says, here's the works that are not from the Spirit, right? And he used things like division, strife, gossip, lying, right? Those things are not from the Lord. So as we're reading these, as we're listening to these podcasts, as we're reading these books, as we're checking out this blog, as we're like, oh, this is the great, that's cool right? But are they causing division? Are they causing strife? Or are they, or do they look more like the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? The, the, the prophets that we follow, the, the modern, like, are they leading us to that? Because if they're not leading us to that, then it were to be wise, right? And we're to turn off the podcast or put down the book or whatever. That's what it should be leading us to. Which brings us to the final people in the list, the pastors and the teachers. And I, I, I want to go to to definitions right now because um, this is this is a spot where bad ideas get into the church and the church gets hurt. So, first of all, let's pastors, when the, when the scripture says pastors, it literally means shepherds. And when it says shepherds, what does it mean? It means a person, right, who leads, cares for, protects, in that case, sheep, right? But the, but the shepherd or the pastor, right, they care for they protect, they guide, they lead. And if you go to the, to the Greek dictionary, right? One time it says pastor, th that, that word, uh, that's the Greek word right there. Again, uh, that's Dave's specialty. But uh, poim poimen, I think I'm a little off on that. But, um, but when, when you see poimen in the Greek, only one, it's one time it's pastor, 13 times it's shepherd, four times it's shepherds, okay? So now, this is what's happened in the church now. You have people, again, this is where bad ideas get in the church through blogs and conferences and stuff. But you have people who, this is a literal statement that will be made. Now, look at the definition as I say this, okay? I'm not a shepherding pastor. I'm a pastor, but I'm not a shepherd. How is that possible? You can be a lot, if I show up to Google, Google, we know Google, right? And let's say I got a really fancy computer science degree from MIT, like, right? The Massachusetts MIT, not the Michigan one. Although the Michigan one's good too. But I, but I mean the, the top one, right? And I sit down at my Google interview and I say, I really don't like computers. How long is the interview going to last when I'm sitting in Google and I say, you know, I really don't like computers. How long is that interview going to last? Done. Done. That interview's over, right? That's how long a pastoral interview should last if that person says, I'm a pastor, but I'm not a shepherd. The interview should end right then. I mean, be polite, right? But lead them out of the building. Because look, the reality is, what, what's, a, what's a shepherd do? cares for, loves, and protects the sheep. There's going to come a day, and this will be good when this day comes. Not just because I want to get an RV and cruise the West, but the day that 
I'm, you know, I've retired, Dave's retired, and this church just keeps going, which is, right, that's what we want. There will be people who come and will say what I just said. I'm a pastor, but I'm not a shepherd. Because we let that idea get into the church. And we let that idea get into the church through the people higher up on that list who write blogs and have podcasts and they talk about the importance of having leadership in church. To have leaders in church is hugely important. As a pastor, I take those classes. They have these cohorts. I do them. Every time they offer one, I do it because I know I got to keep growing and learning. But if you can't care for people and you can't love people, especially when they're going through difficult times and you don't know how to show up next to somebody, right? Like, don't be a pastor. And it's not that I'm perfect. It's not that Dave's perfect. And, and, and look, when I say, I'm not just throwing that. It's not that I'm not perfect. We all do that. Okay, I'm not perfect. I overbook myself. I say yes to way too many things. My time management skills are atrocious, okay? As you know, okay? And sometimes that's adorable, and sometimes that's flat out rude, right? So I know I've got stuff to work on. The job of the person, though, in my position, in Dave's position, in Ben's position, in Phil's position, in Jen's position, in Shannon's position, is to love people really, really well. And that's what, that's what you look for. And I'm going to finish with this, right? Why am I landing on this so long? I'm not planning on retiring any time soon, okay? Right? No. I can't afford it. Let's be real. Okay, so... <laughs> but, but even if I could, I'm not planning on retiring anytime soon, all right? But what, is, what, what, have we, what does the scripture say, right? Test the spirits. That spirit of, well, you know, I'm, I'm a whatever pastor. I'm an administrative pastor. Uh, I'm a visionary pastor. I'm a this pastor. I'm a, but I'm not a shepherd. That's, been, it, that's in the history of this church. That's in the history of other churches that I've been a part of. I've never seen it. I've never seen it end well including in this church. And, it's, and it happens in big churches, it happens in little churches. If you want to listen to a podcast about a church that was, got really big, tens of thousands of people, um, they had a, you know, I'm a pastor, but I'm not a shepherd. They had one of those guys leading it. Uh, so there's a podcast out now called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. It's put out by Christianity Today, but it's about a big church that just imploded on itself because people forgot the basics. And the basics are we love and we care for each other. And the job of the people in leadership is not to be served, but to serve you and to care for you and to make sure that your walk with Christ is growing and is real. That's our job. You ever see us pointing towards ourselves, right? You call us out. You call us out because we deserve to be called out. One, one of the things I say when I call somebody up and say, hey, do you want to be an elder? Here's The number one qualification is you have to be willing to look me in the eye and tell me that is a dumb idea. <laughs> right? That's one of the number one qualifications. And shockingly, the, elder, the elders in this church are like really good. Like you guys vote, <laughs> vote in these really good people who can look at me and say, yeah, no. All right. So let's, let's, let's remember, right? The job, all this fancy stuff with uh, uh, the stoles and the robes, it's all just a reminder of who we're to be doesn't make Dave more special because he went through that, right? It's just a reminder to him what his job is. 
He's to care for you. And he is to equip you to be the people who bring the love of God into this room and this world and this community. That's his job. That's my job. And your job is to go do it. Is to go be that love. Right? Because that's the work of service is to love. It's not about knowing it all. It's about loving all. All right? So will we all continue to be built up until we become mature as individuals and as a church body, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ? I want to end with the words that we used in Don's uh, service yesterday because one of the things that was beautiful about Don as we celebrated Don's life, Don um, was an alcoholic and hadn't had a drink in, I think, 30 years or something, but um, hadn't had a drink in a long time. But what was beautiful about Don is he just kept growing, and he just kept getting better. And he was getting better right to the end. And this big heart that he had, it just kept growing and growing and growing and growing and, and, and loving more and more and more. It was beautiful. He had a beautiful life. And it came from a place of real bitter, you know, like darkness with real problems with addiction, underlying mental health issues, like all that was real for him. But the power of God in his life brought him, right, brought him to better days. So it was true about him, it's true about me, it's true about all of us. Not that any of us are perfect yet. I'm not, you're not. But one thing let's do. One thing let's do. Forgetting what is behind and pressing towards what is ahead. Let's continue walking with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and let him call us heavenward so that this world may know of the love of God, that they may experience it for themselves and that they may experience it through each and every one of us. Let's go be that, those people. Let's go be the church. God bless you all. Have a great week.